Basic Principles of Geneva Conventions Act 1960 Introduction India as the largest democracy in the world and being one of the member states of the United Nations is rightly expected to live up to these principles. The Indian legal and institutional framework is based on respect for fundamental rights India's armed forces have by now established a proud and enviable record of compliance with the dictates of international humanitarian law, to which their military manual by and large conforms. The various engagements across India's borders, as well as those under the aegis of the United Nations, in which India's peacekeeping forces participated have largely demonstrated this compliance. Indian Parliament enacted the legislation entitled the Geneva Conventions Act 1960 for implementing certain provisions of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and incorporated therein a separate chapter on abuse of Red Cross and other emblems with a view to prohibiting and punishing abuses of the emblems. Basic Principles Under the Act The Act comprises of five chapters. The chapter one deals with the title, extent, and commencement of the Act and defines certain key words such as conventions, protected internee, protecting power, and protected prisoner of war. Chapter 2 provides for punishment of the offenders committing grave breaches of the conventions and the jurisdiction of the courts to deal with the breaches. The punishment prescribed under the Act ranges in the descending order from death or life imprisonment for willful killing of a person protected by the conventions to imprisonment for 14 years for other offenses. Under the Act, the jurisdiction to try the offenses, including the offenses relating to the abuse of emblem, is vested with the Chief Presidency Magistrate, now Chief Metropolitan Magistrate or a court of sessions. However, court martial proceedings under the Army Act of 1950, Air Force Act of 1950, and the Navy Act of 1957 are explicit. Chapter 3 provides for legal proceedings in respect of protected persons. What is contended under the foregoing provisions of the Act is the manner in which the trial has to be proceeded for an offence for which the court has jurisdiction and power. The Act makes it mandatory to notify certain particulars like the full name and description of the accused, his place of detention, offence with which he is charged, time and place appointed for the trial to the protecting power, and if the accused is the prisoner's war, then on the accused and the prisoner's representative. The same chapter under Section 9 provides for the legal representation of certain persons. Any person who is brought up for a trial for an offence under Section 3 of this Act or a protected prisoner is brought up for trial for any offence shall not proceed with the trial unless the accused is represented by a legal practitioner and also the legal representative is to be given not less than 14 days time gap after the instruction for the representation of the accused at the trial. However, the detention time can be elongated notwithstanding any other law for the time being enforced until the provisions of this section is complied with.
One of the important provisions of the chapter 3 is the deduction of the term of imprisonment for which the convicted person has been in custody in connection with that offence before the trial. Even in case of penalty, the same shall be taken into account. Though this being the legitimate aim, the same is not provided for other offences in India. On the basis of the above discussion, it can be safely concluded that the Act is restricted in its scope and is limited in its application. The Geneva Conventions Act doesn't seem to have been an adequate piece of legislation in incorporating India's international humanitarian law obligation into domestic law. Undoubtedly, one can draw a correlation between the rights provided in the Act and various other domestic laws, including the Grand Norm. The enforcement mechanism and the remedies available under the Geneva Conventions Act are uncertain and unenforceable. The Chapter 4 seeks to prevent the abuse of the Red Cross and other emblems by prohibiting their use by any person without the approval of the central government. Specially, Section 12 prohibits the use of the following emblems and designations by any person for any purpose whatsoever without the approval of the central government. Number one, the emblem of the Red Cross or the designation Red Cross or Geneva Cross. Next, the emblem of the Red Crescent or the designation Red Crescent. Next, the emblem of Red Lion and Sun or the designation Red Lion and Sun. Next, the heraldic emblem of the Swiss Confederation. Next, any imitation of the above emblems or designation. Any person who contravenes any of the above provisions is punishable with a maximum fine of 500 rupees and is also liable to forfeit the goods upon or in connection with which the emblem, designation, design or worthing was used. Thus, when a private doctor or a pharmacist uses the Red Cross on his vehicle or his business premises, he is presumed to contravene the provisions of the Act and is not only liable to be prosecuted and punished, but also is liable to forfeit the goods on which the emblem is used. The Act further provides that if the offence is committed by a company, the company as well as any person in charge of and responsible to the company in the conduct of its business at the time of the commission of the offence will also be liable to be prosecuted and punished. He can, however, escape liability by providing that the offence was committed without his knowledge or that he had exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of the offence. Thus, when a pharmaceutical firm uses the Red Cross emblem on their product, the company as well as the persons in charge of its business are liable to be prosecuted and punished. The Act, however, makes an exception in the case of misuse of the emblems or designations of the Red Crescent and the Red Lion and Sun, not in the case of Red Cross. By excluding the application of the EBO provisions in the case of a trademark registered before coming into force of the Act, even if such trademark consists or contains a design or wording which reproduces or resembles those emblems or designations. However, in the case of the Red Cross emblem, the prohibition is absolute. The prohibition is applicable to the using of the emblem on an Indian ship or aircraft also. Chapter 5 deals with 
cognizance of offenses under the act and the powers of the central government to make rules a crucial provision however is section 17 which specifically forbids the court to take cognizance of any offense under the act except on a complaint by the government or of an officer duly authorized and thereby it prevents the application of the act against the government or its agencies. Role of Judiciary The Geneva Conventions Act doesn't seem to be an adequate piece of legislation incorporating India's international humanitarian law obligations into domestic law. The Supreme Court of India clearly noted some of the limitations of the act in Rebert Mons Sebastio, Francisco Javier Dos Remedio Monterio versus the State of Goa as follows. To begin with, the Geneva Convention Act gives no specific right to anyone to approach the court. The act was passed under Article 253 of the Indian Constitution, read with entries 13 and 14 of the Union list in the 7th schedule to implement the agreement signed and merely provide for certain matters based on Geneva Conventions. What method an aggrieved party must adopt to move the municipal court is not very clear. It will thus be seen that the act by itself doesn't give any special remedy. It doesn't amount to breach of conventions. The conventions are not made enforceable by the government against itself, nor does the act give a cause of action to any party for the enforcement of conventions. The Supreme Court's jurisdiction has since 1977 undergone sea changes. In Theralia, in matters of human rights or fundamental rights, in the language of the Constitution of India, in situations which reveal serious inadequacies in the Indian law, the human rights provisions in the Constitution have since then been interpreted and applied by the court in harmony with developments in international law without waiting for the legislature to formally amend domestic law. The Constitution of India makes some of the fundamental rights available to all persons and not merely to Indian nationals. Thus, in the Chakma refugees case, the Supreme Court of India specifically held that the Article 21, which guarantees the right to life and personal liberty, is applicable to foreigners as well, and that the Indian state has an obligation to protect the life and personal liberty even of refugees if they have been admitted into the Indian territory. In the light of the human rights jurisprudence, the Indian judiciary, however, the Geneva Convention Act along with the rest of the armed forces legislations referred to above awaits revision to make them compatible with the international humanitarian laws. The principles of international humanitarian law and various provisions of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and also those of the Geneva Conventions Act find fair mansion in the domestic law of India. However, the act itself suffers from various inherent loopholes and drawbacks. Various provisions of Part 3 and Part 4 of the Constitution of India, when read together with the conventions and the domestic acts, further strengthens and give effect to international humanitarian law within the territory of India. Indian national legal framework is extremely conducive and responsive to the principles of international humanitarian law. A considerable amount of academic and juristic work needs to be done to strengthen the hold of international humanitarian law in India. The concept of international humanitarian law is still 
in a nascent stage in India. A serious commitment on the part of India, being a member state of the United Nations, is required to give full effect to the provisions of the conventions. No doubt, the Geneva Conventions Act reflects many fundamental principles of the Constitution of India, yet it is very uncertain and ambiguous with respect to legal proceedings and enforcement of the rights provided under the Act. The Act should be made applicable against the government of India, which will help in its implementation and further in strengthening the rights available under the Act. Various provisions of the Act should be brought in consonance with the constitutional counters of the Indian polity. Specific mechanism for giving rise to a cause of action should be put forth. The legislation which the Parliament of India passes should be brought in consonance with the Act and the conventions.